All right, I'm back with Hidden Figures for Chapter 13, and this is called Turbulence. After six months, Ka Catherine Gob Gobble's temporary assignment to Flight Research Division was starting to look permanent. At the beginning of 1954, Dorothy Von Hahn sat down with Catherine's boss in the division. Either give her a raise or send her back to me, Dorothy said. Although Catherine had spent only two weeks in the West Area Computing Office when she first arrived at Langley, she was still Dorothy's responsibility. The way Dorothy saw the matter, Catherine would either be classified as a permanent member of the West Computing and continue to rotate through the other temporary assignments, or she could become a permanent member of the Flight Research Division. Even though the manager Catherine reported to was not an activist for women in the workforce, act advocate, I'm sorry, of women in the workforce, the meeting ended as both the managers and Dorothy Von Hahn knew it would. Catherine has seen an offer to join the division full-time with an increase in salary. The engineers who worked with Catherine realized that she was a keeper soon after they show, she showed her mathematics skills. Her familiarity with the higher level math made her a addition to the branch. The Flight Research Division was a collection of high-energy, free-thinking, aggressive, and very smart engineers. They spent their time not in the wind tunnels, but live aircraft. They were serious about their work. The head of the Flight Research Division had actually trained at a test pilot in order to improve the quality of research reports. The division was kind of a place that would not show patience to anyone, male or female, who took too long to figure out things how things were supposed to be done. Fortunately, Catherine Gobble's national curiosity and her confidence in her own mathematical ability gave her the courage to ask the engineers a lot of questions. They didn't hesitate to explain what they knew. They spent a good part of their lives thinking about flight, and they could talk about it endlessly. Branches with Flight Research Division inve investigated different topics, such as planes that could travel faster than the speed of sound, and even ones that might be capable of flying in outer space. One of the tasks of the maneuver load branch where Catherine worked was to examine the safety concerns and investigate plane crashes. A bumpy ride. Catherine's first assignment is the group to, in the group was to figure out what went wrong on an accident involving a small Piper propeller plane. The plane was flying along the unremarkable fashion, literally fell out of the clear blue sky and crashed into an apparent cause. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics received the plane's flight recorder, a device that tracks an aircraft's speed, acceleration, altitude, and other measures of flight. The information was essential to figuring out what had happened. It was Catherine's job to analyze the photograph, photographic images of the plane's instruments, record in very small increments of time. Hour by hour, day by day, she looked through a film reader, studying what was happening to the plane before the crash. She learned that the propeller plane flew in a path to, that was larger than a jet plane that had passed through the area a few minutes before. The engineer set up an experiment, recreating the circumstances of the accident, flying a test plane into a trailing wake of a larger plane. The data from that experiment also arrived on Catherine's desk. It was an eye-straining computer work, but Catherine loved it. When the engineer analyzed Catherine's work, they were fascinated to recognize something they hadn't realized before. The data showed that the air turbulence caused by the jet that flew past could trouble the air for as long as a half an hour after it passed through. This wave of air had tripped up the smaller propeller plane as it flew through, causing it to stumble and crash. This was a revelation. Catherine was thrilled to be part of a team that uncovered it. The research done by Catherine and the engineers on the team led to changes in the air traffic regulations requiring minimum distance between flight paths to prevent similar accidents. Catherine thought that the report was one of the most interesting things she had ever read. She also, sat, she also felt satisfied, satisfied to have helped with such an important project. From the beginning, Catherine felt at home at Langley. She took genuine liking in her new colleagues who were opinionated, high energy, and interesting. Best of all, as she knew Catherine was concerned, they were smart as whips. Like other black people, Catherine was aware that discrimination existed at Langley, just as it existed in other areas of life. But she made the decision to block it out of her daily routine. She refused to allow herself to allow it to, too much, to worry about it too much. When she first took the job, she didn't realize the bathrooms were segregated. Not every building had a colored bathroom, and the ones for the white women were unmarked. 
As far as Catherine was concerned, there was no reason why she wouldn't use an unmarked bathroom as well. The next challenge. After they'd been in the Living Newsome Park for two years, Catherine's husband said, I want to move our girls out of the projects. Living in the subdivision when they first arrived in town had made it possible for the family to become part of a black community in the area very quickly, but they decided to move to Mimosa Crescent, a World War II era neighborhood in Hampton that had been built for middle class black families. In 1946, Mimosa Crescent had been doubled in size, growing from its original 20 houses, 22 houses to 51. The area attracted more more richer families who were able to afford the three and four bedroom brick houses. With a lovely new home, a job she loved, and her three daughters all doing well in school, Catherine felt she was living the American dream, at least for a while. Then, over the course of 1955, her husband began to feel sick, first with headaches, then an unexplained weakness. Ultimately, doctors discovered a tumor at the base of his skull where it could not be treated. His health declined over more than a year, and much of that time was spent in the hospital. Catherine's husband, James Francis Gobble, died five days before Christmas in 1956. Catherine was devastated, of course, but she refused to give in to her grief. She had made a promise to her husband that she would do everything in her power to keep their bright, lively daughters on the path that they, would, they had paved for them. Catherine allowed herself and the girls until the end of the year to mourn, and then she expected them to all get back to normal. On the first day of school in January 1957, Catherine met with the school principal. It's very important that you don't show the girls any special treatment or let, in, or let them up in any way, she said. They are going to college and they need to be prepared. Now that she was a single mother, Catherine established a new household rules. You will have my clothes ironed and ready in the morning and dinner ready when I come home, she told the girls. Catherine is now both a mother and a father, the one who offered love and discipline. Each of them would have to work hard to pull the family through the difficult times. The Gobble children excelled in school. They took piano lessons. They were good-natured, outgoing, and respectful. With her steady glaze on the future, Catherine led her daughters towards the long-promising blessings of democracy. She wasn't leading the life she had expected, but she accepted the new challenges with dignity. Catherine's husband's death divided her life in two. As a couple, they had walked side by side through graduate school and marriage, the birth of their children, and their new move to Newsport News. Now at just 38 years old, she was a widow and a single mother, as well as a professional woman realizing her intellectual dream. Her husband wouldn't be there to see her dreams come to come to a T, but she had helped he had helped her get her career launched. All that had become all that had become before Connect was to come. In January nineteen fifty seven, Catherine's daughter went daughters went back to school and she went back to work. The second act of her life was about to begin. So for this chapter I want you to think about how do you think that um Catherine's husband de husband's death could affect her work and could affect her family.